the trail again and again Hacking and hunting and fishing the land Time is time we'll spend We'll take it to the Delta Welcome to Mississippi Outdoors. I'm Pamela Weaver. And I'm Kevin Meacham. Thanks for joining us. In our first story, we go to Sunflower County. The Outdoors crew is on an early season Canada goose hunt. Let's go. We're here this morning in uh, Sunflower County. Uh, we're hunting uh, Canadian geese, uh, resident Can Canadian geese. We're hunting uh, Canada geese in the resident, or some folks say the early September season. It's the 19th of September. Uh, the season runs for 30 days, so you can hunt from September the 1st until the 30th. Hunting over a cut cornfield, uh, harvested probably about a month ago. Uh, Geese been coming in, we watched them grow from about 40 to over 500 plus. It's been a good number of birds in here and um, we've been scouting them for the last several days. So we look forward to having a good shoot. We're gonna be hunting in a cornfield that was probably cut about a month ago. And the geese have been in here trying to just, uh, they're feeding, this is really the only cornfield in this this area here, so there's been a lot of geese using it as a food source. Scouting's the key. Um, I can't tell you how many miles this group's logged on, looking at various flocks, and uh, we like to watch it for a couple days before we actually hunt them. We scouted it for probably two weeks straight. Uh, like I said, we watched it grow. For, eh, it really didn't grow much in the first week. Uh, in the second week is when we started seeing the increased numbers in the afternoon. And about two days towards the end of the week, we watched it grow from anywhere from a, you know 40 to about 150, and then, then it just really progressed. And once we seen that, we knew it was time to set up a hunt and, and get in here and get after it. We like to scout uh, in the afternoon, so typically, where the geese are feeding, that afternoon they will turn first thing in the morning. It takes a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of moving parts. Uh, we had people come out and scout last night, put out some decoys last night to get us set up, put up some blinds, and then come in about two hours early before shooting light and get everything set up, decoys put out, blinds brushed, get everybody set up in the right spots to make sure we have a good shoot. We drive right down the turn rows. We try not to run up the field, so try not to get out in the fields because we respect the farmer. Uh, he's very nice for letting us be out here. Uh, when you come out here to do this, uh, that's our main goal is to not tear up people's land and help them out with the geese because they are a nuisance kind of to them. They, you know, they eat the crop or, you know, if they've got wheat, they tear it up. So setting up with the decoys is it's not a big problem because we have a lot of help everybody puts in their work you know knows kind of what to do with the wind situations and that stuff it's pretty convenient coming out here and being able to drive your trucks right up to the blinds and put your decoys out and uh, be able to get a good setup not have to worry about uh, you better shine the truck lights right out in the decoys and see how they're set up um, not having to guess you know when light comes if your decoys are set up right um, we're hunting over a, a cut cornfield that's been dissed uh, we just dissed recently about a week or so ago, but it was cut about a month ago. Um, these geese like to get in here and dig up the corn that was, that's left on the ground from the combine. Uh, so it makes, it, it makes it a pretty easy spot to, to set up on these geese. We were 
fogged in early this morning. Uh, a good 20, 25 foot haze over the ground and I think the birds were a little slow in getting started. Uh, took about an hour for the for the birds to arrive. Saw a lot of uh, wildlife this morning, a lot of uh, ibis and various other cranes were flying over early, some pelicans. It's a real benefit being able to see these geese coming from miles away. Um, the only problem is that they can't hear you, they can't see you, so we use flags, flags to uh, get their attention. And once we get their attention coming our direction, we hit them with calling. We have about four or five guys calling, other two guys waving flags. Uh, it gets their attention, and once we get their attention, th these geese are pretty, pretty common to come in to call and come in to at least check you out and give you a shot and then you got to choose your shots wisely so make sure you get as many geese on the ground as you can because once you shoot them they're pretty much gone. We like to use flags to get the geese's attention because uh, they really can pick them up from a long ways off as we've got such a low profile the geese we could probably see them from over two miles off and they can't see you, they can't hear your calls, so we use the flags to get their attention. Well, we have uh, kind of a lot of fish farms, I guess you would say, surrounding us. That's where most of these geese uh, stay and roost. So, you know, geese like two things, they like food and water. So normally they're gonna come in and uh, feed early in the mornings and they're going to go back to water and they'll come in and late in the evenings and feed and then go back to the water to roost. Geese are just like doves. They love clean fields. that has got plenty of vegetation in it. Uh, catfish ponds, they love them. And after we had our first shoot, a couple went in there, so we had a hard time competing with them, so we were flagging. Uh, and you get tired flagging. I tell you, it's a hard deal to keep that flag flopping. but. It, once you get their attention, nine times out of ten, they'll lock on and they'll commit and, and the results is, is visible right here with what we did today. Get out, load up, load up, load up. You can't complain. I mean, I think we've got, I think they said 40 plus, so I mean, it's, it's a good deal today. Typically, I don't hunt a dog just because these birds probably weigh 15 to 20 pounds a piece. And after a few retrieves, most dogs are uh, tired, as are the hunters. You know, that's why we don't really, we try not to bring too many dogs. Every now and then we'll bring one. But uh, as you can see, several times, if you've got me out there going and getting them, you know, I'm 240 pounds, toting six geese, it gets tough. I mean, they're, you know, they're 20 something pounds a piece. And uh, that's just, it's just a tough deal. I mean, I was struggling, had to stop and take a couple of breathers every once in a while to get in. So, you know, just it's hard to handle sometimes. It'll wear you out. No, you can't carry those suckers back on a strap like you can ducks. You gotta take them in little groups. <laughs> Normally, uh, just like with duck hunting or anything, the uh, wind direction is gonna be important. We're probably running uh, 50 decoys plus and uh, we like to hunt out of lay down blinds um, as long as it's good and dry you can brush them up good and get concealed a good low profile um, and we hide the blinds amongst the decoys. Location is probably more important than the number of decoys you have. Your concealment being on what we call the X, finding the X where the geese were feeding the morning or the night before you plan to hunt is always the most important part of goose hunting. There you go. As far as uh, shooting the goose, uh, a lot of people ask when we bring them, you know, are, how do you shoot them? Do you lead them? Do you put it on them? Uh, it depends on how they're coming in, you know, I mean, it's just like anything else. Uh, when the goose is coming straight at you, you just put it on him, pull the trigger. Uh, when you get geese from the side, you don't have to lead them as much, but I mean, they're, they're a tough bird. You've got, to, you've got to call your shots at the right time because they're too far out. Uh, you, you, you know, you're just wasting lead. I mean, or steel, because it's it's not going, it's not going to penetrate, and they'll 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 recoup from it and fly out of here. It's nice being able to communicate with everybody in, on the on the row and 
being able to know what's coming and you know when we're going to shoot and set up and all that and be able to just enjoy time with your buddies. I mean, there's nothing nothing better than getting to sit back and tell a few jokes, tell a couple stories, and then enjoy some shooting as well. Yeah, we, we can't thank the farmers enough. I mean, without them, we wouldn't be out here doing what we want to do. Um, I mean, they they're so gracious for letting us you know be out here and. I think they do help. Uh, I think they do appreciate us coming out and knocking some of these geese out. You know, it's kind of a pain for them to come out here and try and farm, and these geese are ripping up their crops and all that stuff. So they they appreciate us coming out and doing what we're doing. But you know, it, it would take an army to to get rid of all of them. I think there's an overpopulation of of resident Canada geese. There's not a lot of people that hunt them, and and there's a lot of a uh, lot of greenery throughout Mississippi, and a lot of a lot of food and an abundant source of food for them, and really no predators. Something we look forward to every year, you know, uh, just like opening day of dove season, we, we get excited for opening day of goose season. It's just a great opportunity. Uh, these birds, majority of them stay here year round. Um, they just don't have a lot of predators, as you can see. Um, you're driving through golf courses or parks, there's plenty of geese and we're not Really putting a dent in the population, we're just, uh, you know, harvesting a few and they usually re reproduce what we harvest the next year. You know, the weather's a little bit hot, mosquitoes are still out, you, you need a good dose of off, but, uh, you know, all in all, it's a, it's a good hunt. For over 70 years, Mississippi Outdoors Magazine has served the readers of the Magnolia State. The magazine contains interesting features such as wildlife photography and soul lunar tables. Subscriptions to the magazine are very inexpensive, and when you subscribe, you'll receive six bi-monthly issues containing articles on hunting and fishing in the state, public lakes, state parks, and our wildlife management areas. For more information, call our toll-free number at 1-888-874 Five seven eight five. Today the use of game cameras by hunters has become more popular, more efficient, and more cost effective than ever. Do you know how many deer were using your property before deer season began this year? One of the most difficult problems in managing a deer herd simply figuring out how many deer are on a property. Most of the properties that we visit as biologists are not using those cameras in a way that is most useful to get density estimates, sex ratio estimates, and fawn crop estimates. You can use the pictures that you're taking throughout the season, or especially right before the season, to get good sound scientific data on the deer herd that is using your property. So we started doing the camera surveys in, in uh, 2013, and we started implementing those camera surveys because we uh, they had a, a big modification in the harvest management on this property. Uh, it went from being a club where it was mostly just recreational harvest, but the landowner wanted to get more involved and start uh, maximizing potential for uh, trophy deer management on the property. When you start implementing a, a change in your harvest management, the, uh, the best tool to track that and make sure your success is, uh, is going in the, in the right direction is uh, a camera survey. So you get a good, uh, a good list of all your unique bucks on the property when you do it right. You can put that together in a photo book for any, anybody who's visiting the property. It's very useful to know what's out there before you go so you know what kind of harvestable deer, your protected deer, and you can make that, that information available you know, with your pictures to your, to your guest hunters or your people who are coming in uh, just visiting and hunting. So we started using trail cameras on this property primarily because we had been looking at harvest data for a while and the harvest data was telling us that we were getting to the point where we were ready to stop trying to reduce the overall uh, deer density on the property. We were ready to kind of try to figure out what that maintenance harvest was going to be on this deer population. And by working with trail cameras and working with the hunters with the deer survey, we were able to figure out pretty much what the population was and figure out how many does we needed to take to be able to get to that population goal. The other thing that was really neat is we were able to watch the sex ratio change over time. We also were able to, uh, to watch those uh, deer density, deer, deer per acre uh, change over time with the management in response to the management. The, the property is about 1,600 acres uh, of, of huntable acreage and um, we, we have 12 cameras out. We try, you try to get as close to one camera per 100 acres as you can. The more data you can have from the camera survey, the more 
well beneficial it'll be to everyone involved with the hunting club, uh, especially the landowner. The biggest thing I use cameras for is just to identify deer and track them from year to year. Whenever I see a deer with a cut in their ear, I put it in a special folder so that next year when I see a cut, I can go up to that folder and find the deer that had the one or two or three cuts and know exactly who he is. We want to be able to find every deer on our place, uh, label it as a shooter or a young deer or a coal. I mean, there's no better time to decide when to shoot a deer than before you see him. The first step in conducting your camera survey would be to obtain an aerial photo map of your property and break it up into 75 to 100 acre blocks. Within each of those blocks, pick a location that has the highest amount of deer traffic to set up your camera sites. These locations can be near established feeders, mineral licks, food plots, or natural travel corridors where deer activity is at the highest. Then place the bait within 12 to 15 feet or four to five steps from the camera. Pouring corn on the ground in a line toward the camera offers more room for the deer to access the bait and gives a better angle of the deer when analyzing the pictures. Permit applications for being able to pour our corn directly onto the ground can be found at our website at mdwfp.com slash camera survey. Mount your camera two to three feet from the ground in order to best capture the body of the deer. Once the camera survey stations are set up and running, don't return to the locations for another five to seven days. For more information on conducting camera surveys, visit our website at mdwfp.com slash camera surveys. In our next story, we're headed to the Gulf of Mexico. Todd Shayu is fishing inshore for some nice redfish. Pretty colors in What we have got here? Another one for the box. There you go, man. Hey folks, we're here in Hancock County for an early fall redfish trip. I got my good friend here, Stanley Hoda, big country Hoda with me, hey, redfish hey. king. Uh, yes, I'm gonna see if we can catch y'all some today on spinner baits and uh, booms, yes, maybe sir. even some plastics. Maybe so. Uh, but we're gonna see if we can catch some redfish. Yes, sir. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. I'm gonna fire this thing up and let's put it in the wind. You know, Stanley, today with these redfish, we got a good high tide. So that means most of your fish can be up tight against the shores. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna get back into some back in some broken marsh. Uh, most of your fish, they're gonna be up feeding in these broken duck ponds and things. But as the tide starts to fall down, we're gonna move up into the pearl. Uh, we got some flats up there we're gonna try. We got a couple more duck ponds down on the, on the up, uh, up the pearl a little bit. Uh, water's really fresh. We've had a lot of fresh water this year, rain, oh, hey. rain. But redfish can handle a little bit more fresh water than the salt can, I mean, uh, trout can. Uh, trout, they, they haven't come in yet. They're waiting on this uh, cool weather. The shrimp, when the shrimp starts falling out, the trout will be moving in. Let's work this flat right here. Yeah, this flat down that side, there's a lot of bait in here. Yep. Oh, that was a good ball there. Oh, we can get on top of him. There he is. Got him? Got him. Back off of him. There you go. Rat red. red. Trout. Trout? Oh, he got off. Ooh, it looked like a little rat red to me. Took your hook. My hooks are busted. <laughs> <laughs> you got no hook on there, Stanley. Stanley, let me see something. Hold on, hold on now. Wait, wait. Turn around here. Stanley, how are you going to catch a fish with no hooks? Ain't a hook on it. Trout? Yeah. Look like a trout. Mom Look at trout. there. I told you that torpedo was bad. <laughs> that ain't bad. A nice little speck. Oh, 
we got here? We got a little rat red. Oh, nice little red. All right, red. first red of the day. All right. All right. Nice little rat red. Yes, sir. Look at that. Pretty. Something we tried to eat him once before or something. Beautiful little rat red. All right. About the same as the last one. Yeah. There we go. Another rat red. Another little red. What I'm talking about. Oh, he's lit up too. Look at his tail. Look at pretty. Oh, that thing is pretty, son. Look how, look how blue his tail. He's lit up. Yeah. You're feeding. All right, where's your, where's your big sister at? That's what I want to know. Oh, yeah. That's good red. Good, good red. Oh, yeah. That's what we come after right there. Yes, indeed, brother. Nice red. Oh, there he is. Oh, there you go. Oh. oh. Perfect size. Perfect. Beautiful. About 20, 22 inches, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ain't ready yet. <laughs> Skinny water fishing. Yeah. Come on out from right there. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Good job. That's, That's what we have to. That's what we have to. 22 <laughs> and a half. <laughs> Got some pretty colors in it. Got a lot of brown and gold looking colors in it. Beautiful fish. We say, Woo oh, that's what I'm talking about. First one in the box. That's what I'm talking about. All right, we need five more. That's enough to get your heart pumping right there. Let me tell you. <laughs> Ooh, you gotta love it, but I tell you, you just gotta love it. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Look at oh. that. Nice bass. Nice bass. Oh, nice yeah. Yum, yum, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, down, down, here, down here, this is a green trout. When you get down here in the, the brackish water, he becomes a, as old timer said, a green trout. Yeah, green trout. Down here in this brackish water, they taste really, really good. Really good. Good sign. Got it. There he is. Nice one, another nice one. Oh, yeah. Look, pretty little fish. Beautiful. Is that pretty? You double spotted? Yeah, like a pair of eyes. Look at it. Mm -hmm. Most I've ever seen was 13. Oh, what we had got here? Maybe Mr. Red has come back to play. Oh, yeah, he's big enough. Beautiful. Beautiful fish. Can be right on the line. Yeah, oh, yeah. 19, 19 inches. inches. I think we got another one for the box. Uh, these are your good eating reds. You'll see us a lot of times throwing these big reds back. This is the fish you want to take home with you right here. These are the good ones. Lead them big ones from make babies. Another good fish right here. That's a good read. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we got us another one for the, the traveling team. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful little reds here. Look at these. Beautiful color back oh, in the shallow bronze, water. Oh, huh? bronze, bronze. Very bronze. He's 18 and a, and a quarter. Yeah, he's over 18. Nope. Nope. Got, oh, yeah, he's, he's still on there. He's still on it. He's on there. He was grassed up. Pretty fish. Oh, yeah. That's the red. Think he'll make? No. Yeah. Pretty. Good fish, too, Yeah, huh? good one. Oh, yeah. That's the deeper red. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Bring him on in here, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Look at that, pretty. Look at that. that is beautiful. Look how pretty that beautiful. fish is. Oh, he <laughs> might make the team, son. Oh, I think so, my he's, man. He's going to be close. Oh, 19. 19. 19. All right. Another beautiful one. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, yes, sir. Hey, we had fun down here on the Lower Pearl in the marshes. Skinny water fishing. Shallow water. We had some redfish, we had some green trout, we had some pepper Second trout. Yeah. I think we, we missed more than we caught, but hey, we had a great time anyway. Yes. You only see this Stanley on? Let's be outdoors. Hey, that's all the time we have for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. Join us again next time for more exciting adventures. Until then, I'm Pamela Weaver. And I'm Kevin Meacham. See, see you outdoors. outdoors. Hunting and fish in the land. Time is time we'll spend.